to Redeemer Free Lutheran Church this morning in the name of our Lord Jesus. And if you're visiting with us today, a special welcome. We're glad you're here. And just let you know you are always welcome. Um, we believe God's Word speaks truth and gives direction and gives hope. And once again, as a community, we're in great need of that, aren't we? Um, so let's, let's continue to, to pray. And we will in our service. But... Um, The Carlson family really needs your prayers and your support, and, and it's so good to see the community responding again as they do. Um, one of the wonderful things about a small town that you don't find so much in a city, but um, keep that in mind, keep that in your prayers. Just a, a word, and I, I was asking our deacons even if I should say this because it's still tentative. Um, they're looking at a likely, not official yet, a service next Sunday. Uh, after maybe about two o'clock, uh, looking at the venue of Canton Lutheran to fit as, as it's going to be a large funeral, um, but that's tentative, so probably shouldn't be telling people yet uh, unless they're asking, is there any idea? But uh, be listening in case that should be changed for any purpose. But tentatively, two o'clock next Sunday afternoon. I think the Carlson family is either on their way or going out to Montana at this point and uh, bringing the boys back then. So, uh, But we, they, need, they need our prayers. Let's open our service with, uh, and then I'll, I'll, I'll get into some announcements after this, but let's just ask God's, we know His presence is here, but let's ask Him to do in us what He would do in us today, and that's in His heart and His mind. Heavenly Father, we... We're reminded so in such a difficult manner of our need for you again. The things we take for granted can change so quickly. So we just call out to you, understanding that you don't change. Your ways are constant. Your love is steady, steadfast. Your righteousness is always uh, wherever you are. So, Lord, we pray that your love and grace and peace and hope and all that you are would fill this community and, in particular, the, the Carlson family in these days. And, Lord, as we worship you as your body this morning, uh, we do so mindful that we are sinful beings in need of forgiveness, in need of grace, in need of your love. So, Lord, as we would offer to you our, our worship today, would you sensitize our hearts and our spirits to what you would say to us and how you would use us at this time. We praise you, Lord Jesus. You are worthy. Amen. 
So before we actually go into worship, just a couple of, of uh, announcements. I, I guess I want to encourage you to read those, that announcement page. There are some things happening imminently. Um, so take a look through that. Uh, the announcements that need to be made, I'm going to call on a couple of people. And on behalf of the missions committee, I'm going to ask Elaine Niebuhr if you would uh, bring us a couple of announcements. There you are. It's Operation Christmas Child time again, and we have some boxes folded back there, and some are not. So whatever you want to take, um, help yourselves. If they're not folded, it has how to pack your shoe case or shoe box up there in that one flap. The pamphlets and everything I've ordered have not come yet. Hopefully they'll be here the first part of this coming week. So that means like how to pack it. The boy and the girl tags are not here. So um, like I said, hopefully next Sunday we will have all of those. These need to be back by November 12th. That's when they will go to Sioux Falls to Abiding Savior to be sent off. So, and besides that, there's the banquet. We need $700 to take up there to cover the cost of the food. And we have had some donations. So if you're still planning on giving something, we would appreciate it if you would get it in as soon as possible. And we also have some spots on the sign-up sheets that need to be filled out. There's initially being up there by 4.30, I believe, or 4.15 to help get everything accomplished as far as preparing the meal and then there are those that will help serve the meal and then those who will take the like the heating pads pans or whatever that are brought out to the banquet serving at the fairgrounds that's where we're going to be at is out at the fairgrounds taking it back downtown so if you um, want to sign up for that that'd be great too because then we would know that we have enough people okay great. thank you thank you also going to call for, on behalf of the building uh, committee, or the, was that on whose behalf you would speak, Kurt? Anyway, Kurt Hepner has a word, uh, an update. Actually, it's to the council. Uh, Tim is not here. He's off having fun in Las Vegas. But he wanted me to bring you up to date as to where we are uh, with the building committee and this expansion project. Um, we have, uh, if you came by sometime a while back and you saw some, looks like somebody was drilling for oil in our in our yard, it's the soil samples that they had to take. And uh, those, those were done, and there's no foreseeable uh, problems at all, nothing that's going to increase our cost at all. So that was a, a positive thing. Also note uh, that uh, we are over 400,000 now in, in, in pledges that have come in. Uh, and God bless you for that, and, and, uh, and let's continue to do that. And then finally, we've, we've got, the, I want to mention that we do have the contract from Jans Corporation. We're going over them in some detail, uh, just correcting minor things. Uh, a couple of typos, uh, a couple of explanations of what certain things mean. We just want to make sure we understand it all. So that's the report from uh, the president and our building committee. Thank you, Kurt. Um, we're going to see one more announcement, but it has to do with something Elaine mentioned a moment ago with regard to the Operation Christmas Child. So if you direct your, your eyes to the front. boxes with such excitement. You see it on their faces, on their smile, in their eyes. Some of them, it's the very first time that they ever received a gift in their lives. We always include about a 10 minute gospel presentation in each event. Jesus loves you. That's what Operation Christmas Child is all about, is to reach children of the world with God's love. And we do that through a simple gift. Happy birthday. They feel like somebody 
there's no greater joy than knowing we're getting to be a part of the Great Commission together. Volunteers across the nation love to spread the word about Shoebox Gifts. There's no way that you could do this without volunteers. They're incredible. The energy that they have, the excitement that they have. I do this because I know it makes a difference in a child's life. You want to make sure that the boxes that we send are something that these kids are going to remember forever. Our volunteers are just incredible people that love the ministry of Operation Christmas Child. This is the Good Samaritan work that the Lord is looking for people to do. When we pray, God takes your gift and He begins to navigate it around the world and it ends up in the hands of a child. God begins to answer those prayers. After a child receives a gift box, the child is invited to go through the greatest journey. They know the story of God and they can tell others by using the books. In the hands of the local pastors, these boxes can be used as a tool to touch a whole community. The Great Commission, we're to go into all the world to preach the gospel, to make disciples of all nations, to baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Evangelism, discipleship, and multiplication, that's what we do. With the sound so full, it cracks the sky. never ceases to amaze me how a simple box can change the world for a child. You know, every shoe box is different. I don't think there's, I've ever seen two shoe boxes uh, alike. They're like snowflakes. But one thing that's common with, with all the gifts, and that's prayer. We, you see, we ask people to pray. Pray for the child that's going to get your box. Can you imagine millions of millions of people praying for children this year? So thank you. Thank you for your prayers. Thank you for your support. We never have enough boxes. We always need more. So please continue to help and continue to pray. God bless. Thank you. Isn't that a neat idea that you can touch the life of a child somewhere else in the world from such a simple thing? So pick up a box if you're able and uh, or two. Take them home with you. Um, I'm going to call on Jeremy just to lead us in our opening worship this morning. You know, the devil is real. He likes to immobilize God's people. He likes to keep them in chains. And the grace of God is powerful, and powerful even to break those chains. We're going to sing about that. It's a familiar song with a, a little more contemporary twist to it, but it's amazing grace. My chains are gone, and Jeremy's going to lead us as we worship. So give your heart to him as we sing. Oh. 
it's by grace that we are allowed to even draw close to God. And in James 4, it's written that if we draw close to him, he will draw near to us. Let's use this next song to prepare our hearts for worship and, and draw near to his throne of grace. Okay. know why in this world we need him it's our sin because if it weren't for him we would have no hope now there's going to come a day when your sin is not going to be your reason for needing him or wanting him as you just sang you're going to want him you're going to need him just out of a love so and so strong that you can't be apart from him and you're going to have eternity with him um, and I, I trust and pray that that kind of love is growing in us throughout this lifetime. But this sin thing gets in the way, doesn't it, so often. So we're going to just acknowledge that to him. I've got some words printed in your bulletin, if you would confess with me before our God. Gracious God, 
Our sins are too heavy to carry, too real to hide, and too deep to undo. Forgive what our lips tremble to name, what our heart can no longer bear, and what has become for us a consuming fire of judgment. Set us free from a past that we cannot change. Open to us a future in which we can be changed. And grant us grace to grow more and more in your likeness and image. Through Jesus Christ, the light of the world. Amen. Pray, obviously, continue to pray for the Carlson family. Are there other prayer concerns on your hearts today? Yes, Pam. And for our president and for our nation. Yes, we should be doing that every day, shouldn't we? We, we need to pray for our president and our nation. Thank you. Others? Yeah, Kathy. On Thursday night at the football game, Alex took a hit on his left knee and tore either his ACL or his meniscus. Oh, I'm, you're Alex. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry so to hear that. For the MRI results to come back. Alex Mastelier on Thursday night's game uh, injured his knee waiting for MRI results, meniscus or ACL. <laughs> okay, let's pray for rapid healing for that. Any others? Yes, uh, Sonia. Okay, say the name again. Bernie Terrell. Bernie Terrell. And any updates from the car accident? He's still needing our prayers for healing. Uh, any particular? Okay, so he'll be doing some rehabilitation in at Sanford next week. Thank you. Elaine. My brother-in-law, Dan, has yes. been moved from the University of Colorado Hospital to back to Craig Hospital. And they're thinking that he could be there for up to a month just to get his strength built back up from the pneumonia. Okay, so just continuing pray. Is it, it's Dan Mikulowski, right? right? Okay. Others. Uh, Irene. Friends and family who don't believe in Christ. Friends and family who need Jesus and don't know him yet. Thank you. <coughs> Kathy. Ron's cousin, um, Marvel Amundsen, who came to church here for a while, but he was diagnosed with prostate cancer. So we just, just I'm sorry to hear that. Many of you know Orville Amundsen, just diagnosed with prostate cancer. So let's lift up Orville. John. To, to add, the, the L family and loss of the illness still? Yes. Richard's mother's funeral was Friday morning. So let's continue to remember Richard and Linda and your whole family. Yeah. And you had another one, John? For Alan Wolf and other service members serving overseas, National Guard members serving overseas. Thank you. Can you all hear Al Wolf uh, serving currently overseas? Let's remember Al and other military people. So we just lost some military personnel this week, didn't we? So. Anything else? Gordon. Debbie's uh, nephew, uh, Evan, and Yesenia were, were wedded to a wonderful celebration last week in Los Angeles. However, I think we need to pray for a, not just a materialistic unity, but a spiritual unity. Okay. And some decisions they have to make. Deb's nephew was married, and I know you were able to attend that wedding. We'll pray for that couple to know and grow in the Lord. So, okay. All right, let's pray together. 
Lord Jesus, again, we come before you as a small portion of your body, and yet in unity with all who love you around the world and in heaven. Uh, thank you for the unity of the body of Christ. Thank you for the hope and the purpose and the direction that we have as your people, as you being our head. Lord, remind us of that every day because sometimes we like to assume that position of being the head of our lives, and we are not. So, Lord, give us direction. Teach us how to follow you. Teach us how to pray. Teach us how to be close to you. And Lord, especially in times when those, uh, when we have loved ones and friends and community neighbors who are feeling so alone and so separated maybe from love, um, at least in, in some fashion. So we continue to pray for the Carlson family, uh, parents and sister and wives and children. Uh, Lord, just envelop all of them right now. Uh, give them direction and uh, do not allow the evil one to take away the light of your presence and your purpose in their lives. So we just entrust them. Uh, we pray, God, for your Holy Spirit to be a part of uh, all that influences this family now in these coming days and weeks. We pray for the service to come, that you would be, uh, your presence and your word would be received, and that it would come in power. Lord, we thank you and praise you for the life of Leona Hill. Thank you for her faith and her home going, the celebration that that can be, even though it leaves sorrow here in this, in its wake here on earth. Continue to comfort and support Richard and Linda and the many other family members who love and will now miss Leona. Father, we pray for our own the people in our lives that we know who need you who, and who don't understand that need, who don't recognize their great need for you. And Lord, we're going to even talk about that perhaps today a little bit from your word, how you would use us in that need. So Lord, uh, we ask you for opportunities and we ask you for awareness of those opportunities as they come to be witnesses to the one they need. Uh, open their hearts and prepare the way. Father, we lift up those who are needing healing in their lives. We think of Bernie Terrell following this accident, the rehab that is coming now in these next weeks and days, and maybe it seems like a forever long road ahead of him. We just uh, ask God that your strength and power of healing would rapidly come upon him and give him a peace in the midst of it. We continue to pray for Dan Mikulowski as he moves from uh, hospital to hospital and is, is continuing to need healing from pneumonia and other things that would set back uh, his strengthening. So we entrust him into your strength, into your grace and your mercy. We pray for Alex Mastelier as he's uh, recovering now from, and will be recovering from this knee injury. And Lord, as the MRI re reports come in, we, we pray for um, a better, a more hopeful report than, than maybe it would feel like in his case going through the pain. But we pray, Lord, that you would bring healing to his body, to his knee um, quickly. We lift up Orville Amundsen as he's just received this diagnosis of prostate cancer. Lord, would you minister to Orville? Thank you for his faith. We pray that you would keep it strong and growing, that you would give him peace in the midst of a, a diagnosis that is not welcome. Thank you, Father, that you, all of these things that bring about pain and hurt and sorrow are enemies which you have defeated. We thank you that anyone who looks to you will have the victory. And we pray, Lord, for Deb's nephew, uh, Evan, and his new wife, Yesenia. Thank you for the, their love for each other. And Lord, we pray that uh, not knowing them, as Deb does or Gordon does, but uh, and as their loved ones do, but we pray that the love that unites them would be 
centered in you. And if that isn't the case, Lord, that it would become that, that they would recognize you and see you and your love for them. We entrust them, Lord, into your purpose for their married life together. Lord, we lift up Al Wolf today and thank you for his willingness to serve this country. We ask God that wherever he is these days, I, that your uh, protection would be upon him, upon other military personnel. We pray for those who have suffered loss this week and their families. Uh, bring comfort to them. Uh, thank you, Lord, that there are people who understand and are willing to make the ultimate sacrifice for the freedoms that you've given us. And Father, we pray for this nation founded upon faith and yet a nation which, as nations all seem to do over time, is drifting. Lord, we ask for a revival to come upon America. We pray for our president that you would give him wisdom um, in his policies, in his words. We pray for your protection over him. We pray against uh, all of the agendas and purposes uh, whose motive it is to destroy and divide. Lord, we just ask for unity in this country again. Uh, we ask that our strength would be grounded in Jesus Christ. Because even as you are the head of this body to which we belong, you are also King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And may we as a nation acknowledge that. And all these things, Lord, we ask and we pray. In the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. I invite you to sign the prayer slip in your pew and just pass that to the center aisle. Uh, it'll be picked up momentarily. Um, also, we would ask the ushers if you'd come forward now and receive our tithes and our offerings. We'll expect to hear more from you. Uh, I had neglected to mention also, I meant to do that earlier, the flowers on the altar are left from the uh, funeral service of Leona Hill. So thank you, family, for those. Would you turn in your bulletin as we use the words of the Apostles' Creed in confessing our faith together? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated on the right hand of God the Father Almighty, from where he will come to judge the living and the dead. 
I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We'll call on Marcin Nelson to bring us the readings from God's Word. The Old Testament reading this morning is found in the book of Daniel on page 768 of your pew Bible. The 12th, cha 12th chapter, verses 1 through 3. Now at that time, Michael, the great prince who stands guard over the sons of your people, will arise, and there will be a time of distress such as never occurred since the time your since there was a nation until that time. And at that time, your people, everyone who is found written in the book, will be rescued. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake, these to everlasting life, but the others to disgrace and everlasting contempt. Those who have insight will shine brightly like the brightness of the expanse of heaven, and those who lead the many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. The New Testament lesson is found on page um, 954 of your pew Bible, the 24th chapter of Acts, verses 1 through 21. After five days, the high priest Ananias came down with some elders, with an attorney named Tertullus, and they brought charges to the governor against Paul. After Paul had been summoned, Tertullus began to accuse him, saying to the governor, since we have through you attained much peace, and since by your providence reforms are being carried out for this nation, we acknowledge this in every way and every where, most excellent Felix, with all thankfulness. But that I may not weary you any further, I beg you to grant us, by your kindness, a brief hearing. For we have found this man a real pest, and a person and a fellow who stirs up dissension among all the Jews throughout the world, and a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. And he even tried to desecrate the temple, and then we arrested him. We wanted to judge him according to our own law. But Lysias, the commander, came along, and with much violence took him out of our hands, ordering his accusers to come before you. By examining him yourself concerning all these matters, you will be able to ascertain the things of which we accuse him. The Jews also joined in the attack, asserting that these things were so. When the governor had nodded for him to speak, Paul responded, Knowing that for many years you have been a judge to this nation, I cheerfully make my defense. Since you can take note of the fact that no more than 12 days ago, I went up to Jerusalem to worship. Neither in the temple, nor in the synagogues, nor in the city itself did they find me carrying on a discussion with anyone or causing a riot. Nor can they prove to you that the charges of which they now accuse me. But this I admit to you, that according to the way which they call a sect, I do serve the God of our fathers, believing everything that is in accordance with the law and that is written in the prophets. Having a hope in God, which these men cherish themselves, that there shall surly, certainly be a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. In view of this, I also do my best to maintain always a blameless conscience, both before God and before men. Now, after several years, I came to bring alms to my nation and to present offerings in which they found me occupied in the temple, having been purified without any crowd or uproar. But there were some Jews from Asia, who ought to have been present before you and to make accusation if they should have anything against me. 
or else let these men themselves tell what misdeed they found when I stood before the council. Other than this one statement, which I shouted out while standing among them, for the resurrection of the dead, I am on trial before you today. The gospel is found on page 908. Please stand as you are able. I'm reading from the Gospel of John, chapter 5, verses 25 through 29. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming, and now is, when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. For just as the Father has life in himself, even so he gave to the Son also to have life in himself. And he gave him authority to execute judgment, because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming in which all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and will come forth, those who did the good deeds to a resurrection of life, those who committed the evil deeds to a resurrection of judgment. Here in the readings. Thank you, Mercy. The congregation may be seated. If you would turn in your hymnal to number 188, Ferris, Lord Jesus. We've been looking at Paul. He says his life was poured out. That's been our theme. Today we're looking at his defense of the resurrection. But you know, as we've been going through this series and as Paul's life was being poured out from place to place, everywhere he went in varying ways and degrees, the message about Jesus was now getting a foothold. I mean, um, far beyond the boundaries of Israel, it was now beginning to get a foothold in Asia and what is Europe. Um, 
people were committing their lives to this Jesus and forgiveness of sins was being received in faraway lands. And righteousness was breaking in on people's lives as they were being set free from their guilt and from uh, a life that had no purpose or hope they couldn't see beyond today. So amazing things were happening through this man that God called uh, who had been against him. But you know the other side when that begins to happen, the devil was getting very angry as he saw what was happening through Paul's ministry. And for the sake of time and calendar, we're not going to follow uh, every chapter through the book of Acts and all of Paul's journeys. We followed pretty closely his first missionary journey. There were two others to come. Uh, so you've got to read through those on your own and find, discover all the things that happened in those. Uh, but we're going to actually be wrapping up this series next Sunday uh, on Reformation Sunday. Um, but as the years went by through those journeys and, and, and Paul's life then began to approach its earthly end, there arose this, this great confrontation between forces of darkness, um, as Satan tried to shut Paul down really numerous times, uh, so those forces of darkness coming up against the force of, of righteousness. So in, in God's hand was Paul and all of these new believers that were being raised up across Asia and Europe in Satan's hands, who do you suppose he used? He was using the rulers of men, the kings of the earth, people of influence who didn't know him. Uh, so I'd like to follow the chronology of events and, and a few of the personalities that were involved in this confrontation that was surrounding Paul's ministry. And as we're looking at this, I think you'll note some of the characteristics that were a part of each side in this confrontation between darkness and righteousness. Now ironically, it was for the most part Paul's own people the Jews, who were instigators of most of the opposition against him. Or to keep it in context, it was the Jewish uh, leaders who were the vessels in the hands of Satan to try to, to snuff out what God was doing through Paul's life. And do you know what it was that got them so worked up into even a murderous frenzy sometimes that came against Paul. Do you know what it was that, that led them to that? It was when he would mention that God had appointed him to preach to the Gentiles. That's what got him really worked up. I mean, uh, the Lord had always been their God. And they couldn't accept that he would offer to gen these unclean Gentiles what he had offered to them. Uh, in Romans chapter 1, Paul says that people who refuse to acknowledge God's ways are filled with all manner of unrighteousness. I mean, when you reject what God is doing because it doesn't fit your model or your expectation or your whatever it is, uh, there's something that wh when, you're, when you're opposed, unrighteousness rises up in you. And then Paul names these various expressions of, of what that unrighteousness looks like. I want to read this to you because it's, a, it's a, an incredible list. It's not a, it's not a fun one. <laughs> Here, listen to this. Evil, covet. this happens when you come against God's ways. Evil, covetousness, malice, envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness, gossip, slander, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. It's a, this is a big list. It's not a good list. And, and to top all of it off, he says, the inclination not only to do these things will rise up in you, but your approval to others who are doing them will rise up in you as well. And the suddenness with which those characteristics can rise up in a human being is kind of alarming. I mean, we, we've seen it in our own day, foot, news footage of uh, mob violence suddenly erupting and causing damage and, and putting everyone's life in danger that happens to be around it. We see it's almost on a daily basis these days, it seems. And it also seems there's nothing so combustible to mankind's fallen nature as when God's righteousness comes face to face, butts heads with human sin. 
That's what's combustible. And it's at that point of confrontation between sin and righteousness that the battle is most intense. Um, we see it, like we said, on so many fronts, even today, anger and hatred are so close to the surface, it seems, doesn't it, these days in the world? Um, oftentimes it's when God's Word or when a position or a movement of righteousness comes against unrighteousness. When godly values are brought into the, into the context, this, this combustible ingredient is right there. And, and understand, this has nothing to do with times or eras or seasons of history. The same situation, as we're going to see here, was evident everywhere Paul went. The same thing was happening. Uh, why is that? Because he was a preacher of righteousness, and his message was always pointing people to the righteous one, whose name is Jesus. And unless you could silence the messenger, that was the, the tactic, the ploy, unless they could silence this messenger of righteousness, then people were being brought face to face with their own sinfulness. And the nat natural reaction to that particular encounter in human beings is to resist it, uh, to fight against it. Now, I think this is pretty accurate across the board. People don't naturally want to come face to face with who they are in their nature. It's not something we like to face. Um, and if they can't even face themselves, they certainly don't want to face God. Even believers, that we, we battle against this because it's, it's this flesh body. Those characteristics that we all need, we're vulnerable to some of that. Uh, so the Word of God, through all of the, the messengers of this Word in your Scripture, continually tell us, stay humble before God. Because you let these characteristics rise up, and uh, that combustible ingredient is right there again. Stay humble before God. Paul says in Ephesians 4, be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. Uh, and it's not about being religious, Redeemer. I hope you, I think you all know that. It's not about being religious. Religious Religious doesn't define who God is. Do you know that? Religion defines who we are, maybe. That's what religion does. Uh, it's about our own beliefs. It's about our own behaviors. That's what religion is. Being re if, if being religion, religious, were equal with righteousness, I, I think Paul would have been equally just both before the day he met Jesus and the time after he met Jesus because in both scenarios, nobody could say Paul was not a religious man. James says religion that's pure and undefiled before God is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained by the world. In other words, it's God-focused and it's others-focused. It's not me-focused. That's what pure religion is. Uh, so how many times do we read, do you suppose, in the New Testament, whether it's Jesus teaching or Paul teaching about Jesus, that the Jewish leaders got jealous when they saw people's lives being, being touched in ways that they didn't know how to reach them. What is it other than, or what could it have been other than jealousy and, and pride and self-righteousness that would have caused anger and hatred to rise up whenever Paul mentioned that God was planning to save Gentiles also. Um, that everywhere he went, that's what was happening. But you know what? As we, as we have followed this, the boundaries to which God had called Paul to have influence had not yet been reached. So as we get into what Marcin read today, uh, Paul was escorted uh, under Roman guard to Caesarea to stand trial now before Governor Felix. And he arrived, and, and Felix said, well, I'll give you a trial when your accusers arrive. Now, these were men back from Jerusalem. So as Marcin started reading, after five days they got there, uh, Tertullus was their spokesman, and he begins his, his charge against Paul by, I think in the translation you read, by calling him a pest in the English Standard Version. He says, this man's a plague. He's a plague. He stirs up riots. Everywhere he goes, uh, he's a ringleader of this sect 
of the Nazarenes, as you heard. He even tried to profane the temple, they said. Now Paul gets up when he finally is given a, a message, a time to speak, and he says, I'm guilty of one of those. I'll, I'll take one of them. He says, This I confess, that according to the way which they call a sect, I, I do worship the God of our fathers. Believing everything God laid down in the law, everything that was written by the prophets, I, I'm in agreement with that through this sect called the way. Now Felix knew a little bit about the way, and it was probably because his wife Drusilla was Jewish. So he probably had a little insight into what was going on in Israel. But it says scripture in the Scripture that Felix put off... Paul and their accusers. He put them off. Um, he wasn't going to make a decision on Paul's case right away. So he put Paul in custody. It turned out to be two years that Paul was kept in chains after that hearing. Um, you know, that's another attribute of human nature, I think. Uh, and once again, it stems from having a me focus rather than a God focus. But Felix was more concerned about gaining the favor of his constituents than he was about administering justice. Now, history tells us, extra biblical history tells us, that he was, after those two years, he was actually removed from office for his neglect or his failure to settle a case between the Jews and uh, the Gentiles in Caesarea. But you know, something interesting was going on during those two years. If you read through the book of Acts, before he was removed from office, the Bible tells us that Felix used to call Paul into his quarters frequently and, and, and listen to Paul speak about his faith in Jesus. Jesus. Uh, kind of makes you wonder almost, are we going to see Felix in heaven? I don't know. But he was curious about what Paul stood for. Acts 24 verse 25 it says, Paul reasoned with Felix about righteousness, about self-control. Do you suppose that's an issue with someone of his power? <laughs> about righteousness, self-control, about the coming judgment. And when he talked about judgment it says, Felix was so alarmed he kicked Paul out of the room. Uh, the Holy Spirit was doing some convicting in this king before he was removed from office. Maybe that was a blessing in his life that he got fired. I don't know. Um, whatever, wherever that led, Felix was replaced by another governor. His name was Festus. Um, and his first order of business was to score some points with the Jews. So he didn't release Paul from prison. He had been in office three days, the Bible says, when he decided to make a trip down to Jerusalem and have a conference with the chief priests and all of the people of influence who were bringing this accusation. They were urging Festus to bring Paul back to Jerusalem to have the trial there, and secretively they were planning to ambush them on their way back to Jerusalem and kill Paul. But God knows these things. And... Felix didn't allow that to happen. He said, no, the trial, if we're going to redo this, the trial is going to be in Caesarea. So another hearing is brought up. Uh, it says, the Jews who had come down from Jerusalem stood around him bringing many serious charges against him that they couldn't prove. Uh, you remember that list of attributes of unrighteousness? They included deceit, maliciousness, slander, and inventors of evil. That's what they were doing against Paul. They couldn't prove any of it, but all of that was coming out. So Paul knew the intent of their hearts, and he knew that Festus wanted the Jews to like him. Um, I don't know why that's such a common trait of political leaders, wanting everybody to like, maybe not our current one, I'm not sure, but, but <laughs> wanting people to like you. Um, but so when, it's, when Paul's turn came to make a defense, he says this, and we heard it, uh, if I'm a wrongdoer, if I've committed anything for which I deserve to die, I'm not trying to escape death, he said. But if there's nothing of these charges to me, you can't give me up to them, Governor Festus. So I appeal to Caesar. He was a Roman citizen. I appeal to Caesar. And Festus conferred with his counsel, the Bible says, and he stands up and announces to the whole hearing, he says, to Caesar you have appealed, to Caesar you shall go. Do you realize Paul just set up an appointment for himself? with Nero. Now, Nero wasn't the next ruler before whom Paul would speak. 
happens to be that there was a king coming through Caesarea whose name was Agrippa. We know him as Herod. Well, not Herod the Great, not Herod the baby killer, the next generation Herod. His name was Agrippa. He was in Caesarea. Of course, it was a political trip, so he would have to spend time with Governor Festus. So they got together, and Festus decided to use this as an opportunity to get Agrippa's take on this guy named Paul. Uh, so I'm paraphrasing this, but he says, I've got this guy that Felix had been dealing with and holding in prison. The Jewish people want me to condemn him to death. But when I heard their charges and I heard Paul speak, there was nothing really so evil about him that deserved, that I, that I had supposed was that I was going to hear. And now I'm directly quoting scripture. He says, rather, they had certain points of dispute with him about their own religion and about a certain Jesus who was dead but whom Paul asserted to be alive. So that's how he presented the case before Agrippa. And he went on and said, I don't know how to investigate what, we're being, uh, what was being disputed. So I asked Paul if he wanted to go to Jerusalem to be tried there, but he appealed to Caesar. To which Agrippa said, I, I want to hear this man. <laughs> I want to hear what he has to say. And Festus said, we'll do it tomorrow. So tomorrow arrived, and of course Agrippa when you have power, what does power do? What does absolute power do? Anyway, Agrippa made a big spectacle of his hearing because uh, he had a lot of pride and he loved attention. The Bible says the next day he came with great pomp and he entered the audience hall with the military tribunes and all the prominent men of the city. And Governor Festus opens the hearing, and I want you to hear his words. He says, King Agrippa, and all who are present with us, you, you see this man about whom the whole Jewish people petitioned me, both in Jerusalem and here, shouting that he ought not to live any longer. But I found that he had done nothing deserving of death, and as he himself appealed to the emperor, I decided to go ahead and send him. But I have nothing definite to write to my Lord about. He didn't know what to send to Nero, how to explain this guy. Therefore, I've brought him before you all, and especially you, King Agrippa, so that after we've examined him, I may have something to write. Do you realize God is using all of these opportunities for Paul? So Paul had opportunity to testify again before another group now what, how he had met Jesus. Uh, so he told his whole story, including the day on his way to Damascus. And in the course of the testimony, Paul shared with Agrippa the commission that Jesus had put on his life. And, and this commission is profound. Uh, this is what Jesus had said to Paul. I'm Jesus, whom you're persecuting. But rise and stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a service and a witness to the things in which you have seen me and to those in which I will appear to you, delivering you from your people and from the Gentiles, to whom I'm sending you to open their eyes, so that they may turn from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. That was the purpose for which Paul was born, right there. And Paul said to King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, and that's why they're trying to kill me. Paul would not be deterred. He would not be deterred from his purpose. So i got to ask you today, do you know, have you thought about this, do you know why God created you? You know, you and I will, won't have the, the kinds of opportunities Paul had to testify of Jesus before rule, world rulers, I doubt. But I assure you, your purpose for being here is not unlike Paul's. And that purpose is to testify of Jesus before the people to whom you have access. It really is. And to the degree that we can say, I was not disobedient to that purpose, God's going to increase those opportunities in your life. Ask Him. Seriously, ask Him in your prayer time how you might be an effective witness to Jesus to the people in your life. If that isn't happening in your life now, ask him about it, because that's, I promise you, it's what he wants you to be doing. At the end of his day before Agrippa, Agrippa made this statement to, to Festus. This man could have been set free if he hadn't made his appeal to Caesar. 
Before we close, I want to ask you this. What would have been your first reaction to hearing that? Do you suppose Paul said, oh, why did I do that? I panicked. I could have been, I could have been home free. I don't think Paul said that. I don't think he ever felt that. And here's why. Because Paul's motive in life from the day he met Jesus was never to preserve his earthly life. Never once. He put that in God's hands and he had perfect peace in it. And even more, because after Paul's arrest in Jerusalem, before all this testifying before kings and rulers, the scripture says that Jesus himself had appeared to Paul in his holding room, and this is what he told him. It's in Acts 23, verse 11. He said, Take courage, for as you have testified to the facts about me in Jerusalem, so must you also testify in Rome. He hadn't been to Rome yet. Paul knew. Paul knew that God's plan for him included testifying before Emperor Nero in Rome. In Rome. And as long as he was obedient to God's purpose, he, he knew he had peace that God was going to work out the details. That doesn't mean it would be easy. But you know what? God uses even evil, uh, the evil nature of people, the evil things that happen to bring about a righteous purpose, doesn't he? In the lives of his own people. And Paul was more than willing, he was even excited to walk whatever path God would lay out before him and whatever suffering he would be asked to endure, he was willing to walk it because it was for the one who had redeemed him from his own sin. And there is no higher honor. I'm going to say this, and this is something that we need to probably have a sermon on or a series on down the road because it's, it's not a popular thing I'm going to tell you right now. But, and I don't think it's a very understood thing, but it is an incredibly biblical thing. Incredibly biblical. There's no higher honor than to be called to suffer for the name of Jesus. Do you know that? We don't like to hear that. <laughs> but Scripture says that in many places. So next week, Reformation Sunday, we're going to close our series on Paul's life as we follow him to Rome and to heaven. Let's pray. Jesus, may we have the conviction and the commitment that you put upon Paul in our own sphere of influence. Oh God, would we seek that out in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing one stanza, the opening stanza of number 260, Because He Lives. Let's stand as we sing. of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true and we are in him who is true in his son Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine on you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.